Let's get into the word of the Lord this morning. Thank you for coming out. A warm welcome to every person whom I haven't greeted yet. And I know that God's going to bless your heart and touch your life. There is power in the word of God to transform your life. And, and, and isn't that what we're after is transformation? Amen. Um, we, we cannot continue the way we are. There has to be a desire to be more like Jesus. Um, Jesus is the standard. Jesus sets the bar. Um, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul was challenging the Ephesians. He says, I want you to measure up, measure up to the full and complete standard of Jesus Christ. In other words, when uh, as a father for me to love my children and to bring them up in the fear of the Lord, Jesus is the model. He is the standard. I have to live up to how Jesus would do that. Amen. I have to love them the way Jesus wants me to love them. When it comes to, my, when it comes to my, uh, my wife and being a husband, Jesus is the model. He's the standard. I need to love the way Jesus wants me to love. Say this with me. Jesus is the model and the standard. <laughs> so we have to change. There has to be a constant change. There, you know, we cannot say that we've been Christians for so many years, but there's no change. You're still just as aggressive as you used to be. You're still just as uh, curseful as you used to be. <laughs> you, uh, you understand, um, th there was no change in your behavior. There has to be a change in behavior, amen. And so I believe God's calling us back to a place of intimacy with Him because it's when you are intimate with God and on your knees like Mary before Jesus, like John leaning on the chest of Jesus, when you begin to hear the heartbeat of God, that you begin to understand God's plan for your life and where, where a desire rises up in you and, and you say, Lord, I, I want to be more like Jesus. It's only when we spend more time with God and pursue loving God more than we've ever loved Him before that change starts to happen. We don't just change because we come to church or you know we have a devotional life unless that coming to church and that devotional life leads to intimacy with God. Amen. So we've been talking about loving God, and I want to continue and just say, God wants you to love Him. Uh, God loved you first, and He wants you to love Him back. And the way we do that, that, that's the great commandment, loving God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And then what is equally important to this is to love neighbor, then as you love yourself, and this is here where Christianity sometimes fall out of the bus. <laughs> it's easy to get to the intimacy part, you know, because we love, we're in love with the presence of God. How many of you love the presence of God? Um, I love the presence of God. We don't want to get out of the presence of God. But you see, it cannot stop there that you know that. The presence of God is not the end goal. Say this with me. God's presence, intimacy, is not the end goal. It's not where it stops because Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, I want you to worship how? Those who worship the Father must worship Him in spirit and in. So, so we need to proceed to truth, to the truth part. What is truth? Truth means you obey God in every part of your life. I say truth means that when you exit from church, when you're done praying in the morning and being with the Lord, now God becomes God of every department of your life, and now you, you, you obey God. Wherever you go, in everything you do, you obey God. Whether, and, and even, you know, for this, for us, um, as, we, as we exit from church this morning, as we go home, many of us will sit at a dinner table, um, you know, and when you pray and thank God for the food there, you worship God. You worship Him, but you're not, you don't have that kind of intimacy with God, but you worship in spirit and truth because there you obey God. You are having a dinner with your family, and through that you're worshiping God. When you go to work, you say, Lord, lead me. Lead me in the truth. Show me how to be creative. Be with me. I involve you. I welcome you. I acknowledge you. And the moment you have that kind of mindset, now your work is offered as worship to God. That's spirit and truth. Every part becomes worship. Worship is a lifestyle. And so I want to talk to you about worship that works this morning. Say with me, worship that works. <laughs> and when I talk about worship that works, I don't, mean, I don't mean that it produces results for you and me. 
because I've seen many people teach on the topic of worship, and it's about what worship can do for you. Now, let me say this. Worship will do many things for you. But you see, when we look at worship, it's not what worship can do for us, but it's what we can do for God. It's, it's all about God. Worshiping God is not about the good pres- results it produces in my life, even though we will see those results. But my worship is to bring something that's of worth to God. My worship is all about God. I was created by God for God. That's the kind of worship that God is after. God is not after this kind of worship that, you know, we, we, we have a little bit about, we enjoy a little bit about the intimacy of God when we're in our worship service. And when we pray, you know, there's a time that we're intimate with God. Um, and, and then we just continue with our own lives and believe, you know, that um, uh, we will get to that place of intims, intimacy again. No, worship worship continues. It's, it's a lifestyle. And I believe that too many Christians do not have that kind of worship that works. And when I say work, I mean that worship that begins with intimacy and leads to a place where we obey God. The start of worship is intimacy. The end of worship is obedience. Say this with me. Worship starts with, begins with, intimacy. It culminates its culmination is obedience, is doing. Turn to somebody and say, we have to do. <laughs> we have to do the what? The work of God. That's worship that works. I hope I'm going to get many amens here this morning because it's a tough message. <laughs> okay? All right, so... Can I, can I have a few uh, amens? Even if you don't feel like say amen, just please say amen, just to get me through this, okay? <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 28, verse 9 to 10. If I was to ask you, you know, who's the greatest king in the Bible, maybe in the history, you know, um, who was the most powerful, most wealthiest king, most known king, you would probably say King Solomon. Yeah, everybody knows that. But did you know that his father instructed him in true worship before he handed over the baton? Did you know that? And I want to show you that he, 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 this instruction was a twofold instruction. He says, I want you to worship in spirit and in truth. Look at this. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9 to 10. The word of God says, and Solomon, my son, learn. Say with me, learn. You see, there has to be, there, there has to be a time in your life where we learn how to be intimate with God. He says, learn, Solomon. You're a youngster. I want you to learn. I want to encourage everyone here this morning uh, to learn how to be intimate with God, to take out the time. Learn to know the God of your anxiousness. There's that word. There's that word, intimacy. I, I, I looked in the translation of the Hebrew uh, of the Hebrew word here, and, and this is such a beautiful translation. Learn to know the God of your anxiousness intimately. I want to encourage you, learn to know God intimately. Worship begins with intimacy. It starts there. Building your relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spending the time, spending the energy, putting in the effort, and it takes discipline. Many people are not intimate with God because you're just not disciplined enough. I I, want to say this to some person here this morning. It's time to set the alarm clock again. (laughs) To get back into your discipline and to make sure that you spend time with God and get intimate with God and do whatever you can to be in the presence of God, to build your relationship with God. He continued. Now, this is David speaking to Solomon, handing over the baton. He's giving him instructions. He says, my son, I want you to worship, shachah, bow down, prostrate in homage, kiss the hand of God, <laughs> and serve him with your whole heart. I, can, can you see from the Hebrew and the Greek words, proskuneo, of worship, that it has to do with humility. There is no person that can worship God unless you are humble. Unless you humble yourself. Worship and intimacy um, uh, is only possible when we're willing to, to humble ourselves. And, and, and this is why, you know, when it comes to worship, I will bow even my personal time. I'll lift my hands up on high. Because I know my flesh doesn't like to do weird things. 
<laughs> Are you with me? I will lay down. I will lift my hands. And, and I'm not talking about in church making a show. I'm, I'm doing it in my inner room. Why? Because I have a heart to worship. Uh, I humble myself. Lord, I need you. I want to be close with you. I want to be a, a person who really loves you. I'm a worshiper of spirit and truth. And this was exactly what David taught Solomon to do. He says, worship and serve him with your whole heart and a willing mind. Worship is focus. Too many of us, you know, when we get into the presence of God, we stand with our hands lifted high, but we think about after the service, we think about what we're going to do today. God says, I want your mind to be willing, to be focused. If you focus on me and pay attention to me, I will focus on you and pay attention to you. That's intimacy. You know, if I sit with my wife and we talk, um, and, and I start to think about other stuff, she will ask me, Hey, where's your mind? I'm here. Hello. I'm talking to you. <laughs> and then I'm in trouble. And man, that's bad. To be in trouble with Marisa, uh, you don't want to b- believe me. Uh, man, uh, oh, you gotta help me. <laughs> so I have to pay attention. Amen. <laughs> you have to pay attention. So a willing mind. For the Lord sees what? The heart. God sees your heart. God doesn't see your actions. He sees your heart. The actions are a result of what's going on in the heart. Humility. The actions are a result of the condition of your heart. God knows your agenda. God knows your motive. It's not what you do, it's why you do it. (laughs) Somebody making a note. It's not what I do, it is why I do it. (laughs) Making a note, amen. Oh Lord, help me. (laughs) It's not what you do, it's why you do it. Because Jesus said, you come with your words, and you come with your actions and your attitudes. He says, but your heart is far from me. Worship starts with intimacy with God, paying attention to God, seeking God, engaging God, spending time with God. Oh, my Father, I worship you. I cry out, Abba, Abba, Jesus Christ, thank you for dying for me. Holy Spirit, I honor you. Lead me, guide me. I love you. I praise you. You are the King of kings, creator of the heavens and the earth and the galaxies, the one who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy. I'm intimate with God. God, and true worship starts there. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit leads me, and I begin to speak in my heavenly language, the gift that I was equipped to honor Him, to worship Him. Hallelujah. And then I get out of that place. Listen to what David says. He says, for the Lord sees every heart and knows every plan and thought. He says, if you seek Him, you will find Him. And in preparation, you know, it became so clear in my heart to say to somebody here, do not say that you cannot find God. Don't say that God is silent. Don't say that God's not there. God says, if you seek me, you will find me. Don't, because you've stopped to seek me, say that you cannot find me. I'm still there. And my plan for you has never changed. God says, seek me. But in our day and time, you know, it's a quick fix. We live in an information era. We don't pay attention to God anymore. We don't buy out the time, you know, to sit with God, to seek God, to study the Word, to fast, to pray, to worship, to pay that price of sacrifice and with our time and everything we have because worship is substantial. It will cost you something. We're not willing to do that. And now we say, well, I can't find God. Och, jy weet, ek weet nie waar is die Heere nie. Nee, die Heere is nog net op die selle plek. He's, he's still, God's still there. And I want to tell somebody here today, it's time that we seek God again. If you're listening to me, God says, seek me and you will find me. Throughout the word of God, we read, we find this promise. Seek God and you will find Him. Seek Him. But you see, you, you need to make the effort. My son, learn what it, David said to Solomon, my son, learn to know the God of your anxiousness intimately. And now, and, and then he says, if you seek him, you will find him, Solomon. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. So David showed him what Jesus showed the Samaritan woman. What is worship? Worship is not where you worship. Worship is spirit and truth. Solomon, worship is spirit. Engage your heart, your spirit, intimacy with God and truth. This is verse 10. Look at this. He says, so take this seriously. Turn to someone and say, come on, take it seriously. Here is belangrijk. 
Solomon, you must pay attention now. He says, the Lord has chosen you to build. That's my message today, worship that works. God has chosen you. God's chosen you to build. God's chosen you. Say this with me, the Lord has chosen me. God has chosen each and every one of us. If he did not choose you, you would not have had his spirit in you. Every person sitting in this place is a soul winner and a disciple maker. It's one call that you cannot escape. Hallelujah. We acknowledge the office of an evangelist. That's to equip us in, 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 in strategy of, evan- of, 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 of doing great exploits, evangelistic exploits. You know, we, we honor the office of the evangelist, but we are all called to win souls and make disciples. We are all called to witness for Jesus Christ. We are all called as ambassadors in this world, and we've all received the ministry of reconciliation, and that's your primary call in this world. Can, world can somebody say amen? You are called to your family. You are called to your school. You are called to your neighborhood. You are called. Don't tell me you're a worshiper who worships in spirit and truth. You go to church and that's it. And then you live your life, but you never witness. You never win a soul. Oh, sorry, am I giving somebody offense here? I told you this, one, this was going to be a tough one. You are called. You are called. You are called to pray. You are called to fast and to intercede. You are called because why? You love God and you love people. And let me tell you, where does our love for people start? It starts by being concerned whether people are going to heaven or going to hell. Because let me tell you, heaven and hell is still just as real as it ever was. And if we love people, we will do whatever is necessary to make sure people don't miss heaven. Can I just be blunt with you this morning? That's where our love for people starts. It starts there. By having a deep-rooted concern that maybe my children are on the wrong path. You're a helper. Maybe my spouse. Maybe my mother, my father. Maybe my uncle. Maybe somebody in my family is on the wrong path. Oh, Lord, help me. I'm called to build. I'm chosen to build. Solomon was chosen to build the temple of God. What does it mean? It means that we are called to advance the kingdom, establish and advance the kingdom of God. The reign and rule in people's lives. Which means they give their heart and life to Jesus and the reign and rule of God is established in their lives and they begin to fulfill God's plan and purpose for their lives. So this is what David was saying to Solomon. He says, but if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. So take it seriously. The Lord has chosen you to build a temple as his sanctuary. Now listen, he says, be strong and do what? (laughs) Solomon, being a king... Being God's child doesn't mean you just learn intimacy. Verse 9 and verse 10 are connected. They are intertwined. Verse 9, worship God in spirit. Seek to be intimate, close, one with God. Worship Him, paying attention to God. Verse 10, do the work. Turn to one or two people and tell them it's time to do the work. It's time to do the work. You can't net sit in my like me. Can't just sit and be beautiful and be passive. Christenskap werk nie so nie, ek is jammer. I'm sorry, Christianity doesn't work that way. Now you may find ministries that tell you it works that way, but it never works that way. It doesn't work that way. You've, you've been entrusted with a ministry. Say this with me, I was entrusted with a ministry. And therefore I must work. There are so many children of God that always battle with the same old stuff. And that's because you've never engaged in the work that God has in store for you. The enemy keeps you busy with your own life and your own issues and everything that revolves around you and you. And the kingdom of God is not built. The temple is not built. Solomon, take this seriously. Say with me, I'm Solomon this morning. God says it's time to build this house. It's time to build the church. It's time to build. It's time to do the work for heaven's sake. (laughs) Let me smile, okay? (laughs) Okay, so that you can see I'm still friendly, (laughs) okay? But this is serious stuff. It's life and death stuff. In a hundred years from now, none of us will be here. None of us. I don't know if the world will even still exist. In a hundred years from now, the only thing that would count is what you're going to do with this message in your school, your university, your neighborhood, and your family. That's the only thing that will matter. Hallelujah. You cannot take anything but souls with you to heaven. Glory to God. It's time to get doing the work. To get going in doing the work. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You remember I told you when we started that 
please say amen. Even when you don't feel like it, now is probably a good time. <laughs> so it's intimacy first. Let's look at verse 9 for a moment. So what is worship? Worship begins with intimacy, and then it, uh, the end goal is obedience. This is why I always say that obedience is... Um, Radical obedience is the highest form of worship. It's not that it's the highest form. It's actually, it's the end goal of worship. It's the end goal. If it doesn't lead in obeying the will and the commands of God and doing the work, you have done only the first part. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very sad that when we hear people teach on the topic of worship, that it never gets to that place where it speaks about fulfilling your purpose, because that's where intimacy leads to. Okay, so, but let's look at this. First Chronicles 28 verse 9, Solomon, my son, learn to know the God of your anxiousness intimately. I just want to say something about this word, learn. Say with me, learn. So I want to ask you this question. Have you ever learned to be intimate with God? When I look at David, I saw there was a season in his life that he learned intimacy. When he was tending the flock of his father, looking after the sheep there in the wilderness where there was no people, no audience. It was just him and God and the sheep. And every now and again, a wolf would come or a lion would come who, who would uh, like to devour the flock and the sheep. And David would then rise up under the anointing of God. And the Holy Spirit would overpower him by the power of God. He would defeat the bear and the lion. With his bare hands and his slingshot. I don't know what else he used. Because the power of God came upon him there. But there he learned intimacy. There he played his music, probably, for the wild animals. Amen. I remember a, a day and time in my life where I learned intimacy. Where, long before I even thought I would stand on a pulpit and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, there was a season in my life where I learned intimacy. And, 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 and that was when I learned to play the guitar. Uh, by the way, I've been a worship leader, a worship director, a youth leader, uh, and, and, and we have even Ilana here, and she knows where I started, because when I was a, a guy with long hair like this, and being a youth leader there in Three Rivers, uh, she was part of that youth. Is it true? Yeah, speak to her if you don't think. And, 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 and she would probably tell you, those days I couldn't play the guitar that well, so I would play a chord or two, and then they were singing, and then I would you know, battle with the change of the court, and then I go to the court, but they know that's how we worship, but we worshiped. <laughs> Those were the days that I learned intimacy with God, and then the Spirit of God came upon me, and I started to write songs, and my father and I joined in ministry, and we planted a church, and we began to sing the worship that came from the time of intimacy, and we saw a mighty revival, and that's the kind of revival that I know is going to take place in this church if we can be patient and, long, and wait long enough and become intimate with God and start to do the work of God. I prophesy revival is coming. Don't sit here and think what's happening in this church. Let me tell you what's happening. There's a war in the realm of the Spirit, but we're going to break through, and a time will come that God's going to fill this house, and that we will. this house will be too small, and we will have to build, and the parking area will be too small, and the inf Fluence and the impact that we will have in this city will be known and God will make us great for His glory and His honor. Hallelujah. I've seen it taken place. But you see, there has to be a season in your life where you learn intimacy with God. And if you cannot play a guitar or any instrument, put on a CD. I know you don't put on CDs anymore. What's it called? Spotify. Marisa calls it Spotify. <laughs> Put on your Spotify, put on your music, put on your Bluetooth, do something. Uh, uh, create an atmosphere. Get intimate with God. Because if we are not first intimate with God and trying to do the work of the ministry, it's going to end up in religion and we're doing it from the flesh. Somebody has to listen to me now. Listen quickly. I'm making a very important point. Some of us, our hearts are as such that you want to do something for God, but you haven't learned intimacy. And now you try to do the work of God. You try to witness. You try to do many things. God will bless that. I believe he will bless it. But here's the thing. It, 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 because it's coming from the flesh. If there's no intimacy, it will not bear the fruit that it's supposed to bear. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's, it's when we're intimate with God first that we bear the kind of fruit God wants us to bear. Some of us are bearing fruit, but it's not 
It's not that kind of fruit God's really wanting. He wants the fruit that we bear because we have began with intimacy. It started with intimacy with God. God says you're doing okay, but learn intimacy. Learn intimacy. Pay the price. Because here's the thing. The Father is looking for us, looking for people this morning to make a choice. To say, I will love you, Lord, with worship that also works. Can you say this with me? If you want to. If you want to, if you believe God speaks to you, say this with me. I will love you, Lord, with worship that works. I will love you, Lord, with worship that begins with intimacy and it continues to work. Say, yes, Lord, I mean what I say <laughs> in Jesus' name. Close your eyes. God begins to show you where you need to work. God shows you now people colleagues he shows you all of a sudden you understand what you have to do he shows you your school he shows you territory he shows you he shows you he sh thank you my father thank you holy spirit thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you lord touch your people with hunger thirst and fire and desire for god and the things of god to winning souls to be the light to be the salt to be a city set on a hill lord touch every heart now Jesus' name, that we will proceed from intimacy to doing the work. Say amen. Give Jesus a big praise. Give him a big praise. Uh, I just want to say this, that many people, um, you've never learned that worship must work. You've always learned about worship. You've heard all the words, sh Shava, Yoda, uh, Yada, uh, Proskeneo, Tehila, Tequila. No, sorry, not Tequila. That one is for the world. I'm just joking. Are you with me? <laughs> you say, what, by the way, the Hebrew word to heal means to sing your prayers to God. So you're not praying, you're singing your prayers. And, um, and so uh, I think one time when I was doing a, a worship conference, it's just like the Holy Spirit said to me, the world uses tequila for the, you know, and Christians are using tequila. Okay, so... <laughs> so we've got the point is we, 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 we get so into the teaching, the doctrine of intimacy that we, uh, that, that we get caught up in that and we, don't, and, and we forget, we forget that there's a work to do. Um, Peter was, was, was like us. He, you know, he, um, if you look at him, you will, you will see the nature, the inherent nature to get caught up in the doctrine of intimacy. And what happens is we stay there all the time. We stay, and, and, but that's a set from the devil. Can you remember when Jesus invited the inner circle? Last week I talked, to, I talked to you about the inner circle. Who was in the inner circle? Peter, James, and John. James and John were the sons of thunder. Peter, you know, was just Peter. <laughs> Uneducated. And, uh, you know, he, he had no filter on his mouth. He said and did just any, anything that came up in his mind. Can anybody relate to that? <laughs> Trish. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry, there's hope for people like us. <laughs> okay, okay. But so Jesus invited the inner circle to the Mount of Transfiguration. On the Mountain of Transfiguration, Elijah, Elijah and Moses appeared, uh, appeared there in visible form, in their spiritual form, but they, they, they appear, they manifested. Their forms, their spiritual forms manifested. And the face of Jesus started to shine, and the glory of God was on that mountain. Peter said, Lord, oh, this place of the presence of God. Lord, can I make a tent for, Peter, uh, for, for Moses, a tent for Elijah, and a tent for you, and we can just stay here? <laughs> Look at the scripture, Matthew 17, 4. Peter answered and said to Jesus, after the transfiguration, he saw the glory of God. In other words, they are as close as God as they can. They experience his presence. Peter said, Lord, is it good for us? it's good for us to be here. It's good to be in the presence of God. Amen. We love intimacy. He says, if you wish, let's make, uh, let us make here three tabernacles or three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. The reason I showed you the scripture is to show you it's, it's in the believer to want to remain in the presence of God. That's why we have to be careful for doctrine of worship that stops with the presence and the glory of God. Because then we make that the goal, but it's not the end goal. It's only the beginning. The end is to do the work. 
Jesus then tapped Peter. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting when you look at the relationship between Jesus and Peter. When you, do, uh, when you do some research, you will find that Jesus, there were times that he was angry at Peter. You know, when he told him, get thee behind me, Satan, you remember that? And then there were times that he just ignored Peter. Jesus didn't always know what to do with Peter. <laughs> but Peter was also the only one of the twelve that walked on the water. Peter was the rock upon whom Jesus built the church. We need Peters, amen. Now everybody wants to be a Peter. <laughs> I want to be a Peter. I want to bear the fruit of a Peter. I can tell you that. Um, and a Paul. Um, and, and, and a John. And we can continue. But here's the point. Here's the point. Jesus just tapped Peter on the shoulder and says, Peter, we can't stay here. There's work to do. He, he said these words. Go study this. He says, let's get down from the mountain. And I believe what God is saying to many Christians in our day and time is please just get down from the mountain and start to do the work. Worship begins with intimacy, but you need to get down from your throne <laughs> because there's work to do. There's a lost and a dying world, and I'm challenging you, church. Let's get our doctrine correct. Let's pursue the presence of God, the intimacy with God. Let's worship Him. Let's honor Him. Let's fast and pray like never before. But let's understand it's where we begin. Let's understand we have to continue to do the work. And I want to ask you this morning, have you made that decision that you will be one of God's children, one of His disciples that will do the work? Come on, think about that for a moment. Think about that for a moment. Remember the words David spoke to Solomon, the Lord has chosen you. He's chosen you to build a temple as his sanctuary. Be strong and do the work. Why be strong? Because it's not easy to do the work of God. Have you ever tried to invite somebody to church and, they, and, then, and then the excuses start? Not easy. <laughs> Have you ever tried to witness to somebody on an airplane or what is it, airplane, a Boeing? Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever, in a, in, a, in, a, in a public space, God tells you to say somebody to somebody? Has that ever happened to you? I'm telling you, it's tough. I remember one time I was in Menland Mall, and God told me to give a word to a person that was in a store. I wasn't even in that store. I just caught a glimpse of this person, and God gave me a word for that person. <laughs> I said, Lord, but I cannot speak to this person. The Lord says, well, if, if, if I can't, you shall use somebody else. Be quick to obey. Be radical now. It's one thing to worship me there in the morning and cry and be on your stomach and be on your knees. But now I'm talking to you. I want you to do something for me. It's important. It's a life and death matter. I said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. And so I got to the person. I couldn't do it. So I followed this person. It was a man. He went into another shop. He went into another shop. I followed him. I, I promise you, I followed this guy everywhere. I became 007. Okay, and then after a long time, he had to leave. He was going home now. So I realized it's now or never. And I couldn't bear the thought that I haven't obeyed God. So, you know, he was paying for his car ticket, his parking ticket. And, and that's when I caught him right there in that moment. And I said, sir, you know, this is what the Lord says. The Lord says you, you, you are doubting if God is real, if he, if he exists. And you're thinking that atheism makes more sense to you than anything else. But God says he's seen your struggle. He sees your mind. And, and man, I started to prophesy. I said, but God has sent me to tell you that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you want to have your name written in heaven's book of life, you need to say yes to Jesus. And then the person just looked at me. And he went like this. And then I said, okay, sir, you know what to do, and we parted ways. Okay. What am I saying? What am I saying? Worship begins with intimacy, and it ends in doing. And that's my question. Have you decided to be a doer of the Bible? If the Bible says you, you must witness, what, are you a witness? When was the last time you've witnessed? If the Bible says that we've got to make disciples, which means there has to be relationships in our lives, that we, that we identify as relationships where we will produce the character of Christ that's already been produced in us. Do you have relationships like that? 
That's, by the way, that's why we believe in connect groups. That's where we formed relationships so that we can reproduce the character of Christ as the character of Christ has been reproduced in us. That is discipleship. Discipleship is not a Monday evening course. Please. That's what I thought when I was fresh out of seminary. I thought it was a course. It's not a course. It's a relationship that God gives us to reproduce the character of Christ. That's what it is. And if there is no, if, if, if there is no doing that, they, then people are not more like Jesus. They don't live more like, they don't measure up to the full and complete standard of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? <laughs> Okay, so the point is, have you decided to obey? I've decided to obey, and there were times that I haven't obeyed. And I was guilt-ridden, and thankfully God doesn't want us to carry guilt. I prayed, I repented, and God gave me. An, but if, you, if there's something, this is what I've learned, if you're not doing what God wants you to do, or if you fail an obedience test, you will write it again. Some of us, after today, you're going to start writing some test over. It's time to write the... I prophesy, this is what the Spirit of the Lord says. The Lord says, after today, you, I'm going to give you those tests, and you will have to rewrite them, and hopefully this time you're going to pass them, because I've got work for you to do. I want you to build. You are chosen to build. You are chosen to do the work. It won't be easy. That's the point. It's never easy. It's difficult. There will always be opposition. There will always be enemy, enemies. The more enemies you have the greater the plan of God for your life. <laughs> but have you made the decision to, to love God through worship that also works? Have you made that decision? And quickly, I want to just show you. If you say, yes, I've made that decision. Time's almost up. Let's take five minutes or so. God, you will experience, and, and there are many things that you will begin to see take place in your life. But I want to just say, just quickly mention three things. When you say yes, you will see the plan of God unfold in your life. God will give you vision and strategy. God will put a dream in your heart, number one. He will put a dream in your heart and give you a plan. He will put a dream in your heart and give you a plan. It's a strategy. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 11 to 12, David gave Solomon the plans for the temple and its surroundings, including the entry room, the storerooms, the upstairs rooms, David also gave Solomon all the plans he had in mind. God has a plan to save your school. Listen, God has a blueprint to save the Vault Triangle. He, he has a blueprint. There's a blueprint in our hearts, in our lives, to, to win our schools, our universities, to win your family. There's a, God will give you a dream and a strategy to start that business that's going to finance the kingdom of God. You see, this is the thing about worship. When you begin to talk about worship, you know it's never just about you because worship is all about God. That business that you want to start, remember God's giving you the vision. He's giving you the strategy, but it's not about you. It's not about you. That career you're pursuing, whatever it is, that career, that job you're doing, that you're praying for, your career, that you're praying for God has put the dream in your heart. He will give you a strategy to see that come into fulfillment. But remember, it's not about you. It's not about you. So, so when you say, yes, I've decided to do the work, God will, give, will put a dream in your heart and give you the strategy. He will put a dream in your heart to see your family your, your, and your people getting saved and even give you a, a, an evangelism strategy. God, Sean, God is a, 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 a strategy for, for that school, for that school. I've said it to you before. There's a reason the Lord has placed you here. He puts a dream in your heart this morning and gives you a strategy to win that school for Jesus. And when all the dreams and strategies come together, we're going to win our city for Jesus. Amen. We'll go across borders, rivers, and seas. And we will see God move and shake within our nation. That's worship that works. The second thing that God will do is he will provide the resources. The reason why some people are lacking is because you're not doing the work. You're trying to survive for yourself. God says it's time that you come worship me, get close to me, and make a decision that you will do the work. Listen quickly. What did Jesus say to the Samaritan woman? After he gave her a definition of worship, he said to her, the Father is looking for worshipers who will worship him in spirit and truth. When you say, yes, I will worship you in spirit and truth, I will worship the kind of worship that does the work, God says, now I release my dream to your heart.
and I give you the strategy. Now I release resources. And with resources, he will also give you a team. Because the plan God has for your life is too big for you alone to complete. I prophesy over your life today that the dream that God has for your life will not be accomplished in your own capacity. You need a team. I prophesy God will send the right people. Hallelujah. And you will disciple those people. The character of Christ has been produced in your heart. You will reproduce and you will love God through worship that begins with intimacy and ends in doing the work. That a good prophecy. You can forget, I'm, I'm not going to prophesy uh, new BMWs, getting married in one week from now, getting uh, uh, money appear in your bank account kind of prophecies. You will not find nonsense like that here, okay? It's the wrong church for those kind of prophecies. <laughs> but I will prophesy that God's going to give you the team. God's going to give you the resources if you are saying yes to the work. <laughs> Hallelujah. You got to say yes. It's time to do the work. Can't just sit here and wait for better days. No, Jesus is coming. The hour is urgent. Hallelujah. People are dying every day. We are ambassadors. We have received of the kingdom of God. We've received the ministry of reconciliation. And that counts for young and old. Young people, don't think you're first going to enjoy your life, please. There's nothing to enjoy there. Everything that you think is there is to enjoy, it will lead, ultimately lead to hell. It leads to, uh, to, to, to damnation. It leads to destruction of your life. There's nothing there. I, how do I know? Because I was young. <laughs> it's empty. There's next door, Sony. Okay. Say with me, God will give me the resources. If you study First Chronicles 29, you'll see, man, there was a lot of resources. And the last thing that God will give you is victory. First Samuel, I say God will give you victory. God will give you conquest. That's, listen, that, that's what worship does. It produces conquest. It produces victory. That's what true worship, worship that starts with intimacy and ends in doing, it produces victory. First Samuel 17, 46. Here, David and Goliath is in conversation. How weird is this? I mean, they're going to kill one another, but first they have this theological debate here. <laughs> so Goliath looks at David. He says, um, David, you come to me with a stick and a stone. You think I'm a dog? You know, I mean, these guys are going to kill one another, but there's like a pause. Then they have this conversation. You know, this big guy and this very small guy. And then David says, well, you know, yes, I, I don't have any battle uh, experience. King Saul offered me his armor, but that's too heavy. It's too big. I'm just a small little man. But I just come from the flock. Remember, prior to this, he was still looking after the sheep. His father took him from there and said, I want you to go to your brothers and go take some food to your brothers. And that's when he saw Goliath. And that's where he saw that nobody was willing to do the work. He says, but what is happening in Israel? Even King Saul that was supposed to do it because he was the tallest of them all. He had, he had the right makeup. He had all the battle armor. He had everything. Listen, God says to somebody here today, I will put an assignment on your life because somebody else didn't want to do the work. I will hand out that mantle. I will put an assignment on your life if you make a decision to worship the kind of worship that does the work. So Saul is too afraid. No, it's too difficult. I'm not going to do the work. So Saul says, well, I'll do the work. I've just killed a lion. I've just killed a bear. Hallelujah. Those are small victories because he's facing Goliath. Now, on his turn, he speaks to Goliath. He says, Goliath, today the Lord's going to conquer you. Did you get that? Pay attention. He didn't say to Goliath, I'm going to conquer you. The battle is the Lord's. God will fight your battle for you. Jesus already won it, by the way. He's not even going to fight. The battle's already been won on the cross more than 2,000 years. I want somebody to pay attention now. Jesus says, you are more than a conqueror because your victory, your battle has been conquered more than 2,000 years ago. And as you start to worship me, I will manifest the victory of the cross in your life. The victory is yours. The battle does not belong to you, but the victory is yours. Hallelujah. 
I've studied victories in the Bible. I've learned this, that it, these kind of victories where God does the fighting, they only came when you and I decide to do the work. I told you, now you, you should have said amen. Now that's one of those times. Uh, because some people think, yeah, you know, what, what's that song that we sang of Jehovah? Help me out. My, uh, what, what? Jehovah is your name. Is it that? Come on, let's sing it. Jehovah is your name. Jehovah is your name. Is it Jehovah? Jehovah is your name. Jehovah is your name. Mighty warrior, great in battle. Jehovah is your name. Mighty warrior, great in battle. Jehovah is. Let's sing it one more time. Jehovah is your name. Jehovah is your name. Jehovah is your name. Jehovah is your name. You're a mighty warrior, great in battle. Jehovah is your name. Let's sing it. Come on. You're a mighty warrior, great in battle. Jehovah is your name. Come on, give him a big praise. He's saying, I'll fight it, I'll fight it, it's not your battle. Say, touch one or two people, tell him, it's not your fight, it's not your battle. It's not your fight, it's not your battle. But hey, if you decide this morning to do the work of God, if you decide to do something and to just do it and get up and do the work, God says, I will fight your battles for you. I'm a mighty warrior. I've won the victory for you more than 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah, man. Praise God op die spot. <laughs> Hallelujah. God's going to fight your battle. God's going to come and prophesy over somebody. I prophesy God's fighting it. It's fighting it. It's, 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 it, it the battle. Let's prophesy correctly, accurately. God has conquered it. God has conquered it. God has already conquered it more than 2,000 years ago. He's manifesting the victory. He's manifesting the victory in your marriage, in your finances. He's manifesting it in your business. He's manifesting it in your future. He's doing it because He paid it more than 2,000 years ago. Come on, give Jesus Christ a big praise in this place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Yira. So David then said, the Lord's going to conquer you. Jesus paid the price. You say, well, Jesus didn't pay the price then. Well, God doesn't work with then and now. He, he, he exists outside of time. Every victory you see is still in the name of Jesus. That's why in the beginning, in Genesis, he said that the seed, capital letter S, singular seed that came from the woman, Eve, will crush the head of the serpent. Why? Because that victory has always been there. It's always been the plan of God. Every victory is because of Jesus Christ and the price He paid. Don't miss. Hallelujah. Speak the name of Jesus. Passover conference, Friday the 29th of March. Hallelujah. I'm a bad announcer. Sorry. Oh, I, I get it. I get it. Let, let Pastor Carl rather comes in. He's anointed for the announcements also. Okay, so, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds. Look, look at how David prophesied. Why? Because there was intimacy with God. I want you to see here that he's prophesying the doom of Goliath. When was the last time you prophesied against your problem? You prophesied, uh, you, you prophesied the outcome to your mountain. You see, we talk, and I know it's a cliche, we talk to God about the mountain, but I want to say it again today. It's time to talk to your mountain about God and prophesy the victory, prophesy the breakthrough, speak the life. Amen. So he says, and then I will give you dead bodies. I'm going to kill your men, Goliath. You, you don't understand. Of your men to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet. Yes, that was the battlefield song that Goliath and David had. I mean, we've got a whole team up there, but they knew. Give them some time. Amen. Lift your hands to the Lord.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We give you all the praise, all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of the Lord will come upon every person in this place this morning. Touch your people. Stir your people. In Jesus' mighty name. If there's a person here this morning, you've heard the word, the Spirit of God spoke to you. Uh, but you know that you, uh, you know that you need Jesus. Can we just lower our hands for a moment? You know that you need Jesus. You're uncertain if your name is written in heaven's book of life. You used to serve God or hardly fully, but now you know, don't know where you are anymore. You're uncertain, but you're excited. Something stir in your heart this morning, and you want to return to Jesus. If that is you, and listen, people, what I'm doing here is not protocol or cliche. I'm telling you, it's a matter of life and death for people. We're very serious about altar calls, they, and, and, and we cannot have a service unless we don't have, also have an altar call to give people room to make things right between them and Christ. Because if there's confusion in your heart, the devil will, the devil will come and kill, steal, and destroy in your life. He will mess with your life if, you, if, you, if you're not certain. So if you want to be certain this morning, if you want to give your heart and life to Jesus, if you want to surrender every part of your heart, Right there where you are, quickly raise your hand right now, and I want to pray with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Donkey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Donkey here. For elke persoon, every person. Those who've lifted your hands, pray this prayer after me, and I ask the assembly to join. Say, Father, this morning, right now, I surrender my life to you. I'm sorry for what I've done. I realize I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, you are the Savior. Thank you, my Father, that you gave Jesus. I believe in my heart, confess with my mouth, that Jesus is Lord, and you've raised him on the third day from the dead. Here's my life. Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you. As from this moment, my name is written in heaven's book of life. Holy Spirit, come and fill me. Holy Spirit, come fill me. Touch me. In Jesus' name. Let's pray this together. Say, Father, help me to worship you, spirit and truth. Here I am. I make this decision today. I will do the work. Show me, Lord. Please don't give my assignment away. I'm sorry if I haven't obeyed or if I've neglected you. Sorry. Done my own thing, I'm sorry. I, I make a decision, I will do the work. You can use me. Speak to the Lord for a moment, right there where you are. Cry out to Him. Just surrender your life. Father, I pray as people pray this morning that you will show them the assignment. You've seen their decision. They said, we said we will do the work. Please don't give our assignment away. We're sorry if we've dragged with it. We're sorry if we've, if we've caused our own delays. Lord, we're sorry. We're sorry for our disobedience, for staying on the mountain. But there's work to do down the mountain. We come, we come down from the mountain also. We will love you through a worship that works. I pray, Lord, touch every heart now. Show them the assignment, the people, the faces of people that they will witness to. Show them now. Show them. Show them quickly, Father. Holy Spirit, thank you that they will get a glimpse. A school, a university, a, a home, a family, member, a, a, a colleague. Show them. And Lord, it's not easy, but you say be strong. Be strong and do the work. Be strong. Thank you that you give us the strategy and the courage. Courage, I pray for your people. In Jesus' name, amen.